totally just have to find the cover. Now, we're not going to bother these, but this is a bunch of Huns that have all pulled right together on a very cold day to share the heat. They are terrific with the rain and the snow right next to the road and they're not out feeding yet that's why you need a covey of hounds generally at least six or seven or eight birds you shouldn't shoot them below that because they need to get together like that they put all their tails together oh and there's a couple spread out here huddled together to share their warmth. Great to see these birds. I'll show you one more close-up. Huddled right together in the snow, not in the brush, right in the snow. I want to show you a gray partridge or a Hun or a Hungarian partridge. His very distinctive reddish tail and his brown feathers and if you can see on his eye he has orange. It's a nice male. If you can see the orange fading white on his eye. And if we turn him over this is the way you've seen him in many fine art still lifes. This is the, the way a bird has been properly an exotic. He was brought to North America from the plains of Hungary and he was uh, an exotic that does not disrupt any other animal here in North America and he lives in the stubble fields like uh, fields like this only there's some cattle in this field but along these edges of grass and edges and he lives in a stubble field he doesn't compete with any other bird maybe a little bit with a sharp-tailed grouse, but generally the sharp-tailed grouse has uh, has more cover that it needs, but he's right out there in a stubble field. Gorgeous little white-meated bird. Very, very tasty, and if you look at him, you'll see him in a lot of uh, the fine art of uh, still lives hanging with this side. And this is generally a uh, the sign of a, a male, adult male, this reddish on the breast. And you can see, but but uh, the reason I, I believe that they were always part of the fine arts was in the 1700s they were probably just developing shotguns and to shoot this bird out of a covey with the early early shotguns had to be quite a trophy had to be a very rare shot so I'm sure that's why it was uh, celebrated in uh, in the still lives in much the same way we're recording it here but like I said what's important about this hunt is it's a exotic that was introduced and we think of it as a native now it's been here so many years but it it's a way an exotic should only be introduced when it doesn't affect any of the existing native birds. And this, this hunt is just a glorious bird, one of the most fun birds to hunt. They jump in coveys and, uh, and uh, usually right at the edge of gun range. So they're uh, quite a trophy. Great day here in Alberta, 29th of October 2002. You can hear the geese in the background of the Bow River. We... Right, we well, got one, broke the ice. This is to show you how well a Hungarian partridge, although from Europe, mostly from Hungary, and the plains of Hungary, and if you go into the fine art museums all over Europe, you see always the Hun, because think back to the days when guns were not very well developed and shotguns had very, very little expertise and, and fine tuning. To get a Hun was quite incredible. And there, there is the Hun, the way it landed on the ground. And you can see why it's also called the gray partridge. And the cock birds, but sometimes the hen, have this very distinctive reddish mark on their on their breast. So this looks like we've gotten a cock bird. This also shows a little bit, which I'll show you closer more, but of the reddish part of their tail. So now I'll 
have Pierce Nelson, who has been doing some fabulous camera work and should have gotten that uh, covey jump. It's quite impressive when they jump. They're very, they're very alarming birds. Great fun. Here we are with this gorgeous cock Hungarian partridge. And as you can see against the snow, he is called a gray partridge because he's really quite gray as well. But his wings are this gorgeous color of brown, much like the sharp tail. But on his tail, he also has a very reddish tail. So when he spreads his tail when he flies, you have this reddish effect. And if you also look at his head, and I don't know if Pierce can get a close-up, but we can try. I'll try to get it, Pierce, like that. If you look at his head, you'll see that he's mottled on the top. And then there's a band of gray, and it goes into gray. But he also has, since he's a cock, he has an orange eye. Can you, I don't know if you can make out the color, but as the cock, he's got the orange eye. And then, the way you always see them in fine art museums and all through Europe, is the cock has this very red breast. Sometimes the hens have it, and the younger birds have generally a small patch of it. But an older bird like this, the gray goes into a little bit of the mottled brown and then into this reddish brown that makes this arc. And as you can see, he has feathers down about as far as he can too for living in the snow, but his feet aren't covered up like the sharp tail was. He's got scaly feet for running because this bird also is a white meat bird and he, he prefers to run instead of fly. And you can also see that he has a nice reddish brown underneath. He is one of the greatest little birds and one of the finest eating birds there is. And he survives on the stubble fields and what's left over behind other birds. And again, he was not native to North America. He's been brought from Europe again, I think about a hundred years ago. So we'll go and see if we can find some more. We've now moved about a mile to the west. And we're looking across towards the north, what is known as a buffalo jump. And you can see it's relatively flat up here on top. And then as it becomes flat and flat and flat, you have this row of pine trees. But these pine trees may not have been here in ancient days. And then you suddenly have a precipitous, and I mean gigantic, precipitous drop. This is what's known as a buffalo jump. Where the first hunters in this wild country used to drive the buffalo in a stampede on this flat ground. And they would keep pointing them until they would run over this cliff. And when they ran over this cliff, they would all fall to their death. And then our American Indian, Native American, famous hunters would come and clean up the carcasses which would feed them for the entire winter but these animals would plunge to their death and many times when they would get there they wouldn't be dead so they would come and kill them with arrows and spears it's amazing how much more effective a bow and arrow is today or a rifle's bullet but then they needed to eat today we perhaps also need to eat wild game, not just for our body, but probably for our soul, and to understand this earth we live on and how it lives in a cycle. So hunting today is just important, but we're not allowed to run buffalo over an edge and a precipice to their death. But this is the way our previous hunters on this land got their hides for warmth and to make their tents and food to get through the cold, bitter winter. We're on the buffalo jump again, and we've been looking over the edge, and there was a mule deer laying down the bottom. Here's a little bit more view of the buffalo jump and how precipitate it was as the buffalo careened off it, bouncing down the cliffs to the bottom. And then this wide open valley and the mountains on the other side. 
And one of the things you'll see is a gap over here. It goes up into what's called the Durfies. And you'll see that gap in the bottom part of the mountains. Well, right in there is where we shot that bull elk with a bow and arrow last September. It hit 100 degrees that day. And this morning, the wind chill factor about two months later is under zero. So there's a hundred degree change. And the elk come feed in the bottoms and then would wander up to those mountains. In September, they still do. But it's a gorgeous day here on the buffalo jump in Montana. Right there is where our elk was downed with a bow. And here is the buffalo we'll jump from a little farther east. But it gives you a flavor of how precipitous the drop is. But there are outcroppings that peak out periodically like this. the buffalo jump, we see some mule deer does, and as we get closer, we see that we have a mule deer doe bedded, and a sizable mule deer buck, who is staying right with her. The rut is on, and he doesn't want to leave her at all. We'll look down the buffalo jump. And as we look over the buffalo jump, and see how precipitous it is, and we'll try to fall, not fall off ourselves, we look there and we see that there's a broad open plain here where the buffalo would be driven. And we wonder where our pre-Columbian predecessor hunters here have gone and where their hunting instinct has gone. But even more than that, a recent study has just come out on DNA of males spread through Europe and they found that 80% of those DNAs are from hunters. So 80% of the males in Europe today, and obviously a lot of Europeans moved to America, so probably European, Americans with European background have a hunter background. Only 20% came later to Europe with an agricultural background. So where have all the hunters gone today? Do they not have a place to hunt? Do they not know what the wild is all about? Or is there hunt video games? And the stock market? And other aggressive activities that we don't think about hunting, but really are hunting? If we don't preserve places in the wild for them to hunt, maybe they'll never really understand their roots and their essence and never understand how their predecessors survived this harsh ground to make it here. But 80% of us are probably hunters. We're probably all hunters. We just don't realize it. We sublimate it and, and do it in different ways. But you can see our Native American friends would push, would herd the buffalo in massive waves over this very precipitous cliff and then finish them off on the bottom as they were probably most wounded and not completely dead and then start the process of making meat which is many people today think of as messy but it's the way we survive just as we've learned that in Africa there apparently were two human species one that was primarily vegetarian and one that was vegetarian and a meat eater and according to the evolutionary chart which one met their demise well it appears that the vegetarian did because when things got scarce they only had one choice of food they had gotten too far out so having a variety of choices may allow us to live on this earth and become more spiritual as we grow and help this earth prosper